In this unit, we'll study thermodynamics, which is the study of energy and work relationships for chemical and physical changes of matter. In the first semester of general chemistry, we learned how to quantify heat and work exchange as a measure of the energy changes for any process. In particular, you were introduced to the concept of enthalpy, or delta H. This indicated the transfer of heat or thermal energy into or out of a chemical system. In this unit, we'll introduce the concept of entropy, which quantifies the mass and energy dispersal of a chemical system. It's the combination of entropy and enthalpy changes for any chemical reaction that can be used to predict whether that process will occur spontaneously or not. This is a central goal in thermodynamics to predict whether or not a chemical reaction will occur and how changes in conditions can affect the spontaneity of that reaction. So what do I mean by spontaneous? Well, in chemistry, spontaneous processes are those that occur naturally on their own. Non-spontaneous processes, on the other hand, require a continual input of energy from an external source to occur. And this is an important point. We're not talking about whether or not a reaction is possible. Non-spontaneous reactions are not necessarily impossible, they just won't automatically occur on their own without the addition of energy. Let's look at a few examples. Water runs downhill spontaneously, right? You place the water on a slope and it goes down. Water flowing uphill, on the other hand, is non-spontaneous. You can get water to flow uphill, but you have to push or pump it up the hill in some way. And the minute you stop pumping or applying that external force, the water will flow back downhill spontaneously. Here's another example. At room temperature, ice melts spontaneously. Place it on the countertop and walk away for a while and you'll come back to a puddle of water. Now the spontaneity of this process is conditional. It depends on the temperature. Melting only occurs spontaneously above the freezing temperature of water. Below that point, ice won't melt. So you don't have to worry about ice cubes melting on their own in your freezer. Below the freezing point of water, it actually turns out that the reverse process of freezing is spontaneous. Let's look at another example of a conditionally spontaneous process. Salt dissolves in water. Drop a teaspoon of salt in a glass of water and walk away for a long enough time and you'll find that all the salt is dissolved. It may dissolve slowly, but it will dissolve. You can speed up the process by stirring the glass. This changes the rate, but it doesn't change the spontaneity of the process. The salt will still dissolve on its own, until it finally reaches the saturation concentration for the water. Concentration for solutions, or for gases, pressure, is one of the other major conditions that influence spontaneity. Once the water reaches its solubility limit, or saturation point, for salt at a given temperature, we'll no longer be able to dissolve more into the solution spontaneously. It turns out that if a process is spontaneous under certain conditions, it does two things. First, all spontaneous processes increase the dispersal of matter and energy in the universe as a whole. Second, all spontaneous processes decrease the total potential energy of the chemical system involved. These are the driving forces in determining spontaneity for any process and being able to quantify these will allow us to predict whether a process is spontaneous or not. In this PowerPoint, we're going to examine the first requirement. In a later PowerPoint, we'll look at changes in chemical potential energy. So entropy is the thermodynamic property that measures the dispersal of matter and energy for any substance. You may also have heard it characterized as a measure of the disorder of a system. The more disordered or dispersed matter and energy are for a substance, the higher its entropy. Statistically speaking, entropy is a much more abstract definition. 
While we won't be doing any calculations with the formal equation for entropy, it's worth taking a minute to examine what it represents. The entropy of any substance, which we characterize with the variable s, is equal to the Boltzmann constant, lowercase k, which is equal to 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23 joules per mole per Kelvin, times the natural log, or ln, of the number of microstates, characterized by the capital W, that's possible for that substance. So the key component here is this idea of microstates. So what is a microstate? It's a specific configuration of the locations and energies of the atoms or molecules that comprise a substance. Perfectly clear, right? Let's see if it makes a little more sense if we look at a simple visual example. Let's imagine two boxes that are connected together. Inside the two boxes, we find four particles. The particles have different colors here simply to allow us to visually distinguish one from another. There are several possible configurations for these four particles between the two boxes. So first, you can have all the particles in the left box, as in row A, and no particles in the right box. Or you can move one particle from the left box into the right box. If you move the red particle into the right box, that produces one possible configuration or microstate. If it's a different particle though, say the green particle, that's a different configuration and a different microstate. If it's the blue particle, again, a different microstate and the yellow particle, a fourth microstate. You can get even more microstates or possible configurations if you distribute the particles more evenly. Two in the left and two in the right. So in this row, we see six possible configurations for the different patterns of dispersal of these different particles. We can increase our number of microstates even more if we consider whether the particles are in the left box versus the right box. So for example, in row D, we now have one in the left box and three in the right. So four possible microstates, similar to row B, but flipped. We can see the same thing for row E, where this time we have all four particles in the right box instead of the left box. So each of these different setups is considered a different microstate. And when calculating entropy, we count the total number of microstates possible for our system. And the higher the number of microstates, our W value, the higher the entropy. So what types of systems or situations result in more microstates and higher entropies? Well, we can see in this example that the distribution that was the most even, two and two, actually resulted in the most number of microstates. And this points to a fundamental concept in entropy. The more dispersed the particles involved, the more different microstates possible for those particles and the higher the entropy. So this visual example looked at the dispersal of mass in terms of particle position, but we can extend this analogy to include energy distribution as well so that entropy describes the dispersal of both matter and energy. So entropy can change between reactants and products during any physical or chemical process. We can define this change in entropy, or delta S, as the absolute entropy of the products minus the absolute entropy of the reactants. 
So if the products in a chemical process are more disordered or dispersed than the reactants, then we say that the entropy increases over the course of the reaction and the delta S value will be positive. On the other hand, if the reactants are more disordered or dispersed than the products, then entropy decreases over the course of the reaction and the delta S value will be negative. Ultimately, we will apply numbers to these entropy changes. But first, let's see if we can predict whether the sign will be positive or negative for some simple common processes. Let's look at phase first. Which phase of matter do you think has the greatest dispersal of matter? Solid, liquid, or gas? If you answered gas, you're correct. If we look at these particle illustrations of the phases, you can easily see that the particles are more dispersed in the gas phase and least dispersed in the solid. That means that the gas has the highest entropy and the solid the least. Knowing how entropy varies with phase, we can predict whether entropy will increase or decrease during different phase changes. For example, in melting, where we go from a solid to a liquid, our final phase has more entropy than our initial. So the change in entropy will be positive. It's the same for evaporation or boiling, where we go from liquid phase to the gas phase. In contrast, freezing and condensation both go from a higher entropy state to a lower one. As a result, these phase changes have a decrease in entropy and the delta S value will be negative. So if the process of freezing involves a decrease in entropy, why does ice form spontaneously below zero degrees Celsius? The answer is that the spontaneity of a process is driven by the increase in entropy of the universe overall, not just the change in entropy of isolated reactants and products. So the second law of thermodynamics states that for any spontaneous process, the entropy of the universe must increase. In other words, the entropy of the universe, represented here as delta S with the subscript of UNIV, has to be greater than zero. Now we can define the entropy change of the universe as consisting of two parts. The entropy change of the chemical system, whatever we're studying, and the entropy change of everything around it, everything else, which we call the surroundings. It is possible for the universe as a whole to increase in entropy even when our chemical system becomes more ordered or has a decrease in entropy as long as the entropy change of the surroundings increases to a greater degree. Here's a graphic representation of this relationship. In both of the scenarios represented, the entropy change of the system under study is negative, just like it would be for ice freezing. In scenario one, the associated entropy change of the surroundings after the ice freezes has a larger positive value and the net entropy change when we add these two together is actually positive. Under these conditions, the process represented by the system will occur spontaneously. So this is the scenario when ice freezes below zero degrees Celsius. In scenario two, 
the entropy increase of the surroundings is not large enough to counterbalance the decrease in entropy for the system. As a result, when we add these two together, the entropy of the universe is actually negative overall. Under these circumstances, the process is not spontaneous. This is what happens above zero degrees Celsius when we try to freeze ice. The key component here is the direction and magnitude of the entropy change of the surrounding. So what are the key factors influencing the value of delta S surroundings? As you might have guessed from the example of ice freezing, temperature is one of the major factors influencing the magnitude of delta S surroundings. The other is the amount of heat transferred between the system and the surroundings. Heat exchange between the system and the surroundings is represented by the enthalpy change delta H of the system. So the entropy change of the surroundings is formally defined as the negative of the enthalpy change of the system divided by the temperature in units of Kelvin. As we learned in the first semester of general chemistry, for exothermic reactions, delta H values are always negative. Because the entropy change of the surroundings is defined as the negative of the enthalpy change, this means that the entropy delta S change of the surroundings will always be positive for an exothermic reaction. In other words, for exothermic reactions in which heat flows from the system into the surroundings, the entropy of the surroundings will increase. In contrast, for an endothermic process, the delta H value of the reaction will be positive. The negative of a positive enthalpy results in a negative entropy change for the surroundings. So for endothermic reactions, the entropy of the surroundings will always decrease. Finally, the temperature at which these heat transfers occur will affect the absolute magnitude of the entropy change of the surroundings. Because temperature is in the denominator of the formula, lower temperatures will always result in larger absolute values of delta S. In other words, the lower the temperature, the greater the effect addition or removal of heat has on the entropy change of the surroundings. Let's try pulling all this together and adding numbers into the mix. From the second law of thermodynamics, we know that the entropy of the universe must increase for any spontaneous process. In other words, delta S universe must be greater than zero or positive for a process to be spontaneous. We also know that we can calculate the entropy change of the universe as the sum of the entropy change of the system plus the entropy change of the surroundings. We can substitute into this expression the equation for the entropy change of the surroundings as the negative of the enthalpy change of the system, delta H, divided by the temperature in Kelvin. Now, if we can define values for the entropy and enthalpy changes of our chemical reaction, we can then calculate the entropy change of the universe during this process and determine if it's positive or negative. So you can calculate standard entropy and enthalpy changes for any chemical or physical process relatively easily using standard reference values. We'll review how to do this in the next PowerPoint. For right now, I'm just going to give you the already calculated values. Let's look at the process of freezing water. The entropy change is negative 22.0 joules per mole Kelvin. The negative value indicates a decrease in entropy associated with the phase change from a liquid to a solid. 
the units of joules per mole Kelvin are the standard units associated with entropy. And it reflects the formula for entropy change of the surroundings of enthalpy in units of joules per mole divided by temperature in Kelvin. Freezing is actually an exothermic process. Energy must be released to go from a liquid to a solid, and this is reflected in the negative value of the standard enthalpy change for this reaction, negative 6.01 kilojoules per mole. Let's use these values to calculate the entropy change of the universe when water freezes at negative 4 degrees Celsius. First, we need to make sure everything is in appropriate units. Entropy is in joules per mole Kelvin, which means that our delta H values need to be converted from kilojoules to joules. Our temperatures also need to be converted into Kelvin. We can then substitute these values into our formula along with the entropy change of the system to calculate delta S universe. Looking at the second term, representing the entropy change of the surroundings, 6.01 times 10 to the third joules per mole divided by 269.15 Kelvin gives us 22.3 joules per mole Kelvin. Notice that the negative of a negative gives us a positive overall. When we combine 22.3 joules per mole Kelvin with our negative value for the entropy change of the system, the net sum for the universe is positive, 0.3 joules per mole Kelvin. The entropy of the universe does increase when ice freezes below zero degrees Celsius. This is a spontaneous process. But how do these values change when we look at a higher temperature? Let's try five degrees Celsius. This is still pretty cold, the equivalent of about 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Now the entropy change and heat exchange of the system remain the same at negative 22.0 joules per mole Kelvin for the entropy change and negative 6.01 kilojoules per mole for the enthalpy. We still need to convert everything into the appropriate units, so we'll use negative 6.01 times 10 to the third joules per mole for the enthalpy value. And we'll add 273.15 to our temperature to get 278.15 Kelvin. We can now substitute these into our equation for delta S universe to get negative 22.0 plus the negative of negative 6.01 times 10 to the third divided by 278.15. The negative of the negative enthalpy will become a positive again, but we're dividing by a larger denominator. And this means that our delta S of the surroundings value is going to be smaller overall at 21.6 joules per mole Kelvin. Heat flow into the surroundings makes a smaller difference in the entropy of the surroundings at warmer temperatures. Negative 22 joules per mole Kelvin from the entropy change of the system added to our entropy change of the surroundings gives us a net sum of negative 0.4 joules per mole Kelvin. At this higher temperature, the entropy of the universe would decrease and the process is non-spontaneous. So if the entropy change of the universe is positive for ice freezing below zero degrees Celsius and negative above zero degrees, what value would you expect for delta S universe at zero degrees, the actual freezing point? If you said it would be zero, you're correct. At the freezing point of a liquid, which is also the melting point, by the way, 
the processes of freezing and melting are considered in equilibrium. In other words, both are occurring spontaneously at equal rates. When a process is at equilibrium, the entropy change of the universe is actually equal to zero. In summary, entropy is a measure of the dispersal of matter and energy, and spontaneous processes increase the entropy of the universe overall. Delta S universe is the sum of the entropy change of the system and the entropy change of its surroundings, everything else. And delta S surroundings during any process depends on the direction and magnitude of heat exchange from the system, delta H system or enthalpy change, as well as the temperature of the surroundings, T.